This is flipped mini lecture number 27 covering night 10.6. And uh, as with the previous one, I've actually already given this material in class on Wednesday. So this is for your review or in case you missed that class. And I'll tell you the bottom line. The bottom line is that the if you can calculate a potential energy for a force, then you can turn around and if you were given that potential energy and you didn't know the force, you could take its derivative with respect to x and get the x component of the force back. And of course you can do the derivative with respect to y and get the y component of the force back. You can do the derivative with respect to z and get the z component of the force back if it's a two or three dimensional problem. So let's show this. The work is defined to be the sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 of f dot delta r sub i. And you're supposed to understand this in the limit that n goes to infinity. Or another way of saying that is the limit that all the little delta r's get extremely small. So that says, you make this path, you chop it up into pieces, you calculate an f dot delta r for each piece, and then you chop it up into finer pieces and, and recalculate, and then you chop it up into even finer pieces and recalculate, and you take that limit that n goes to infinity where this is chopped up into infinitely fine pieces, and you sum up all those infinity of f dot delta r's, and that's the actual exact formula for the work. So let's imagine, let's look at this part of the formula and let's imagine how much it simplifies if the particle is only moving back and forth in the x direction, okay? So actually the force might still be uh, some vector force, you know, like it might point off that way there, and it might point off that way there, and it might point off that way there, and it might point off that way there. The force is still some vector force, but for some reason or another, this particle is moving stuck, moving back and forth along this track, which only moves back and forth in the x direction. And we want to calculate the work done by that force as it moves back and forth along that track. Okay, well, if it's only moving in the x direction, then this thing simplifies a lot. Let's write out what this thing is. This thing is f sub x dot delta x plus f sub y times delta y plus f sub z times delta z. That's just the definition of the dot product. You got the x component of the force dotted with the x component of the displacement. You got the y component of the force dot it times the y component of the displacement, and you've got the z component of the force times the z component of the displacement. And of course, each of these displacements has a little subscript on it, i, which says this is the x component of the ith displacement. Okay. Well, that special case that I was saying uh, is nice because if the particle's only moving back and forth in the x direction, then it's not moving at all in the y direction, and it's not moving at all in the z direction. So whatever this force is, f sub x, f sub y, f sub z, doesn't really matter what its f sub y and f sub z values those are going to be multiplied by a delta y i, which is 0, and a delta z sub i, which is 0. So if the particle stuck back and forth moving on a track, this sum simplifies to sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 of f sub x delta x sub i. Okay, now let's, before we go any further, um, proving the thing that I said I was going to prove at the outset. Let's remind ourselves what a sum like this actually amounts to. Um, let's graph some function. 
This is my x component of f. This is my x position. Maybe here the x component of f is positive, and maybe over here the x component of f swings over to some negative value. What this says is, as you're going from the uh, initial position, x sub i, to the final position, let's say x sub f, which you've chopped up into a whole bunch of little bits, then you take delta x sub i and you multiply it by fx. Well, that is just a, the area of a little rectangle. Let's say, let's do this just for ducks here. Let's just do this with, uh, say, i equals 3. So this is the zeroth chunk. This is the first chunk. This is the second chunk. This is the third chunk. i equals 3. Well, this right here is width is delta x sub 3. This f sub x, this is f sub x at x sub 3. So this is whatever f is there times whatever this width is there. And with this height and this width has the interpretation of being this area. And of course, the fourth one has the interpretation of being this area. And the fifth one has the interpretation of being that area, etc. So you can see that uh, what we're actually calculating here, if you're already this far in your math course, what we're actually calculating here is the area under the curve using what's called the, the Riemann integral, which, me, which says, well, chop it up into a lot of little areas and then take the limit. Of course, all of this stuff was interpre interpreted as taking the limit that n goes to infinity chop it up into much smaller bits, recalculate the area, chop it up even further into even smaller bits, recalculate the area. And as you chop it up into smaller and smaller bits, the little tiny errors that you make, which are these spots right here, these little spots where the rectangle doesn't quite agree with the curve, these little spots get vanishingly small. And your math class, I, well, I could go a little further here and show you that those little tiny spots don't matter in the limit that n goes to infinity, but um, that's the kind of the focus of, of, of pr the proofs and the limits in the math class is making sure that you're not making um, errors in, in the limit. So just believing that those errors get smaller and smaller as you take the limit that n goes to infinity, this becomes what the area under the curve, which is of course the integral. So what we've shown is that uh, the work is, if you're this far in math, the work is the integral from the x initial to x final of f sub x at x dx. That's, that's the real definition of the work. These sums that I've been throwing up here are a way of leading you to that. So the proof, the thing that I set out to prove um, you need to consider, think of the work itself, which is an integral. You need to think of how it depends on the only two things that it depends on if the particle is moving back and forth. It depends on x initial and x final. Uh, let's just take x initial to be zero, okay? Let's make our lives easy. Let's make x initial be the zero position. So then really the work now only depends on x final. So you can think of the work as a function of x final. And when we had that little example a moment ago where f went like this, um, what that interpretation is, if we're taking the initial position to be zero, that's the area under the curve from zero to x final. And now here's the interesting thing that I want you to consider. Consider, Instead of just that, consider the work at xf plus delta x minus the work at xf divided by delta x. Okay, well, the work at xf plus delta x, instead of being that area that goes to up here to xf, that's the new area that goes from here, doot, doot, zero, all the way up to 
xf plus delta x, where this is now delta x, this is xf, this is the point xf plus delta x. So the work at xf plus delta x is the area all the way up to this point under the curve. Now, the difference between the area all the way up to xf plus delta x under the curve minus the area all the way up to xf under the curve is just this new added area. So we see that the, new add, the, the numerator can be evaluated and simplified if we can just figure out what this new added area is here. Well, the width of this new added area is delta x. And the height of this new added area, if you use that approximation where you're trying to approximate the area into the curve by a little rectangle, the height of that area is fx at xf. Of course, that's an approximation, right? Because xf over here at xf plus delta x might be a little bit different. But we, we can assume that this is a good approximation in the limit that delta x goes to zero. So the difference of these two things is delta x times fx at x final. OK, so pop that into the numerator, and, and, you'll, and then divide by delta x, and we're just left with fx at x final. So we found that, it, what have we found? We found that if you take the derivative of the work with respect to the final position, so you take the derivative of the work, which you're thinking of as a function of x final, with respect to its final position, and you get the x component of the force at x at the final position. Then the only other thing you have to add into this is that the work done is uh, minus the change in the potential energy. So there's your expression for the work up to the point xf. And you can see from this expression that the derivative of the work with respect to x f at xf is minus the derivative of u with respect to xf. Okay, so that we got a new thanks we combine these two formulas and we get a new formula that says minus du of xf dx is equal to fx at xf. Now the only other thing that we have to do to make this look like uh, the formulas in night is um, I was very explicit about the fact that the potential depends on where you've gotten to, and I called the place where you've gotten to x final, but Knight just called the place where you've gotten to, he just called that x. So we can drop all these little f's on the x final, and now we have the formula minus the derivative of the potential with respect to x is equal to the x component of the force. And if you really think about this, and we will think about this soon, if you really think about this, there wasn't a whole lot about this proof that uh, depended on the fact that we were using the x direction. So if you were doing it in the y direction or if you were doing it in the z direction and you thought of the function, the potential as a function of x, y, and z. So this says, I know the potential energy. I know it at any point in space, which I can label by x, y, and z, I know the potential energy at that point in space. If I'm in some kind of three-dimensional situation like that, and somebody says, hey, I don't want f sub x, I would like f sub y, then you just do exactly the same proof that I did, and except you think about moving the particle back and forth in the y direction, and then you would have learned that f sub y is equal to minus the derivative of u with respect to y. We'll get a little more into what these mean, how we actually write them, uh, but you can see I can get any component of the force if I know how to take a derivative with respect to the corresponding variable. That's 910.6.